Hey dudes, Duke the Builder here, and in this episode of Zig and Death, we're going to be looking at concurrency in Zig, uh, specifically uh, using threads or multi-threading. And if your CPU has the hardware support uh, for executing multiple threads in parallel, then you can benefit from parallelism when you're executing your program. Um, here we have a little work function which mimics uh, doing some type of computation. We're going to be using uh, stud time sleep, which basically puts the thread to sleep. And here we're uh, calculating a one times uh, stud time nanoseconds per second, which basically uh, is equal to one second. After that, we print out this little message uh, with debug print, notifying that we're finished. The first thing that we do in main is get the logical CPU count with get CPU count, stud thread, get CPU count. And this, uh, when I say logical CPU count uh, or logical CPU unit, I'm referring to the, the actual hardware available um, threading paths that you can execute in parallel. So for example, in a multi-core system, it'll be the number of cores. And this can be influenced also if your processor has uh, technologies like Intel's hyper-threading. And that uh, result, we're going to store it in this constant called CPUs. It's important to note that this is only a runtime value. This cannot be um, uh, evaluated at compile time because if you think about it, only when your program is actually executing on, 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 on a specific hardware platform is when you can query and find out how many logical CPU units you have available. So uh, with that, we're going to be seeing our first example here, which basically is without any threading. Uh, we're going to be using here a normal synchronous mode of execution with a for loop for the amount of those logical units. In this case, I'm running on a multi-core machine that has eight cores. So this will execute eight times and we will call the work function passing in the current iteration. So let's uh, move on over to the terminal. And what we're going to be doing here is we're first going to we're going to build with zig build, and if that's successful, then we use the time utility to see how much pretty much it takes to execute our generated binary. So let's do that, and as you can see, we're getting the output from that work function basically once per second, and uh, at the end we get uh, pretty much a total of eight seconds uh, for the whole program execution, which is to be expected because, I, I, as I said, I have a, a, an eight-core eight, uh, system. So this executed eight times, and each time took one second. And since we're not using any type of parallelism or, or multi-threading here, um, each function call has to wait for the previous one to finish. So let's clear the screen and go back. Let's... Uh, comment this out and take a look at our first example of using uh, multi-threading in Zig. What we're going to do is we're going to create here an array of, uh, called handles. I'm using here the literal eight since uh, the size of the array has to be known at comp time. It cannot be a runtime variable uh, value. Um, I can't use this CPU's uh, constant. So here um, I'm cheating a little. <laughs> I know that this system has eight uh, cores, so I'm using here the um, literal eight here for the size of the array. In a context where you can't do this, uh, where you really won't know until runtime, you can then use an allocator. Instead of using uh, a fixed uh, array like this, you can use an allocator to allocate the necessary uh, space for the handles for the threads that we're going to be creating here in this loop. Here, um, uh, once again, we're going to be iterating for the number of logical uh, CPU units. And for each element in the array, we're going to be assigning the result of calling stud thread spawn. And spawn takes three arguments. The first one is like a uh, configuration options, which we usually can leave empty like this. The second one is the name of the function that we want to execute in our new uh, newly spawned thread. 
And the third one is a literal tuple, similar to when we're printing, that we pass in the, the, the arguments we want to print in a tuple. Well, uh, in spawn, we do the same thing, but what, what we, the elements of, uh, or the fields of this tuple are basically the arguments that we're going to be passing to the function that we specify as the second argument. So here, this function only takes one argument, and that argument is what we're passing here in the tuple. And then we have another for loop here, uh, this time on the array itself of handles. And what we're doing is calling the method join on each of those thread handles that we received from spawn. And what join does is it'll wait until each thread finishes executing. Um, if we don't do this, we run the risk of uh, the calling function. In this case, it's main, um, the, the function that, that spawned those threads. If we never call join, then that function could finish before the threads finish and that work will never get done. So let's uh, save here and once more, let's build and execute. And now, as you can see, we didn't see that output gradually uh, coming out uh, second by second. We basically got the output all at once. And another important aspect of uh, multi-threading is, as you can see, uh, the execution is not in any order. So this is what's called non-deterministic uh, execution. You, 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 re you really can't know in which order those threads are going to be executed and which threads will be finishing first. So you can't count on a certain order when, you, when you're using this type of threading. But um, aside from that, we can see that the total execution time is about one second. So um, even though that function takes one second and we're calling it eight times, since we have here the benefit of parallelism in a multi-core system, um, basically the execution of all of those uh, function calls uh, only takes the time it takes to execute one of those function calls. So let's uh, comment this out and let's take a look at our next example of threading. In this case, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be um, calling once again for each of the logical CPU units here in our for loop. Um, we're going to be calling our thread spawn uh, function just like we did before. But this time we're not storing the handles uh, in an array. We're basically just storing the result of that in this um, handle variable. And then instead of calling join, as we did uh, in our previous example, we call detach. And what this does is it relieves this main thread, the thread that's spawning this other thread. It relieves it from having to wait until that thread finishes. We don't have to call join as we have, as we did here. And basically it just sets that thread uh, loose. <laughs> And um, and we don't once again we don't have any guarantees that uh, this main thread could finish before the spawn threads, and then you would have uh, uh, work that never gets done. Um, and to make sure here that we can get at least some work done, I'm calling on the main thread this thread sleep once again. But this time I'm, 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 I'm sleeping for 1,001 milliseconds, which basically uh, will equal the one second execution of all of the threads plus one millisecond. So let's take a look at how, how that uh, behaves here in the terminal. We build and once again run. And here, as you can see, we basically have the execution of all of the threads and uh, it, it once again took about one second. Now let's clear the screen and try that again. And this time we only see that one of the threads uh, had a chance to finish executing and then the main thread finished before the others. So when you detach from a thread you have to be aware that um, the, the, the spawning thread, the, the spread that's, the, the thread that spawned the other thread could finish first. 
And uh, maybe that's not going to be an issue if your program is a long running program, for example, like a daemon or a service that runs supposed to be running forever. Then maybe in that type of scenario, you can use detach without any issues because the, the program is supposed to run forever and the threads will have uh, a chance to finish without any problems. So let's comment this out. And now let's see a more powerful example here that we have available in the standard library, which is using what's known as a thread pool. And a thread pool basically is uh, a group of threads that uh, is managed uh, as a single unit. Uh, in this case, this thread pool data structure that's available in the standard library will manage uh, the, 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 the working of those individual threads, which are commonly known as the worker threads within the thread pool. Well, uh, all we need is an allocator here. We're going to be creating an instance of our GPA, our general purpose allocator. Once we have that, we uh, have our variable here uh, of type stud thread pool. And then we call the init uh, method on that variable, passing in uh, an object here, basically a tuple literal here. And we're specifying that it has a field called allocator and we are assigning our allocator to that field. And that's the allocator that the thread pool will use to allocate space for the new threads. And um, once we have that, we use a defer to handle the deinitialization of that thread pool. And now in this for loop, we make use of the thread pool by calling the spawn method of the pool. And the spawn method is pretty much like the stud thread spawn, but it doesn't have that configuration options first argument. It just has the argument for the function that we want to execute and the arguments, uh, the literal tuple here for the ag arguments that we want to pass to that function. So this basically will uh, send basically this, uh, this work that we want to do here represented by this function to the thread pool and the thread pool will handle assigning this work to any of the available threads within the, the thread pool. And by default, the thread pool will allocate uh, the number of threads, will spawn the number of threads equal to the number of logical units, uh, CPU units that you have available. So in this case, uh, this thread pool will have eight threads. So let's uh, save this and let's build and run once again. And here we go. Uh, as you can see, we are having the su successful execution of the eight threads. And it's once again taking more or less one second to execute all of the work. And if we run that again, we're going to see that we have indeed the same output. This time, the order keeps on being different. As I said, this is non-deterministic. But uh, we are achieving basically what we did uh, previously by manually spawning threads. With the thread pool, it, it's made really easy. Um, once we have our pool, we can just give it work uh, to do and um, it'll handle all of the details for us. So I hope you find this useful. Do the build it here. I'll see you in the next one.